Welcome back to Computer Science 4303. Today, we are in Lecture 7, which is talking all about Assignment 2, which I'm excited about because I really like Assignment 2. It's like where the course really starts to um, get interesting and useful, um, etc. So, what we're going to do is we are going to have a look at Assignment 2 and what it entails, and then we're going to go over the README file, we're going to go over the marks, and then we're going to go over the code to see um, exactly uh, what we have to do. Okay, so first of all, let me launch my solution for assignment two over here, and it is showing full screen, perfect. Okie doke, so what we are doing for assignment two is we are essentially making our own um, navigation mesh, distance map, and vector field for pathfinding. So I have this uh, little user interface here where we have an environment and in that environment we have these rectangles that we can resize, okay? So these rectangles are going to be obstacles for our pathfinding system. So over here you can see that I can drag these, they can be like partially off the map. And then in the background what you see is our navigation mesh. And so as we drag a rectangle, which is in our environment, it can exist at like a pixel resolution. Um, we are updating our grid representation of our navigation mesh to essentially say that anything that intersects with um, any rectangle is considered blocked in our environment, okay? So first of all, after, after I show you that, let me just press the H button and I've got some uh, controls here. Now, when you get your assignment and it's not complete, it won't have this bottom part. Only my solution has this because I've added some extra functionality, but it will have this, uh, this top part up here. So let's go through that uh, really quick. So first of all, um, let me show the E key. So if I hit um, H again, I go back. So I can, uh, first of all, the, the rectangles are resizable, okay? So there's no like change in the in the in the mouse cursor or anything but if you drag within a few pixels of the side of um, a rectangle you can actually resize it and that works in the x and the y direction if i hit the e key i can put a new um, rectangle into the environment and you can see here that we're updating our navigation mesh in real time if i hit the w or s keys so W is going to increase the number of grid cells and S is going to decrease the number of grid cells. So if I hit the S key, you can see that we're decreasing the number of cells, meaning that essentially the cells get larger, okay? So we can see as we increase um, the size of our cells, our navigation mesh essentially gets less and less accurate, right? So we talked about this in the lectures, how, um, we always have this trade-off between accuracy and running time. So if we have fewer cells, we're going to have uh, a better running time and a better memory usage because we're using less cells, so less memory, and less cells means less computation. However, as you can see here, just watch, I'll show you an example. Let's say I have um, this rectangle right here and I move it to be right here. So if I had an object in my world that was smaller than this gap, technically my object could pathfind between these two things, right? But because of the abstraction of the navigation mesh and how we're considering something blocked or not, you can no longer pathfind through here, okay? So that is again, it's trading accuracy for speed of computation. If I click down again, then this just gets like even bigger and even less accurate, but as I increase the number of grid cells, you can see that, okay, this is actually getting more accurate now. So to the point where there's basically no difference between the navigation mesh and where the rectangles are in our grid, okay? So let's put that back down to something a little more reasonable. And then we'll go back here. Um, the other keys are toggle vector field display, toggle navigation mesh, and toggle grid line display. So toggle grid line display just draws the grid lines or not. So that's a pretty easy um, intuitive thing. 
What was the last one? Uh, toggle navigation mesh display. So the D key will draw the navigation mesh or not. Um, so that turns off the, um, it turns off the grid as well. And the last one was toggle the vector field display. So the whole point of this assignment is that you are going to be calculating this navigation mesh. So you're essentially calculating where the red cells are. Um, and you're calculating a distance map and you're calculating the vector field from that distance map. So if you recall from the last lecture, we showed how in a grid where we have a goal location. So the goal location here, let me uh, get a few fewer cells. So the goal location here is wherever we click or wherever we click and drag. Okay, so if I click that yellow spot, that is going to be the goal location for our distance map. So if I hit the A key here, this is the solution. So the solution is already done, so it's working. So I'm going to click a button, and you can see here that I do indeed, let me make this a little bit bigger, have this distance map that we talked about in the last lecture, okay? Where we're doing a breadth first search outwards, and we're marking each cell that is navigable um, to have an integer value which is equal to the distance in up, down, left, or right movement from our um, from our goal location. Okay, then if I hit the A key again, it will switch from the distance map view to the vector field view. Okay, so let me go back real quick. So here, for example, if I'm looking at this cell here, this four, right? Um, in order to get from this cell to the goal, well, I need to go toward the cell, which is adjacent, which has the lowest value, right? So I'm going to go toward this three. So if I toggle the vector field, then this one is indeed moving straight to the left. So the way this is drawn is that you can essentially think of this as an arrow pointing from the center of the cell. Okay, so if the center is here, then this is pointing to the left. Now let's consider this cell right here, this five. And so in order to get from here to the goal, we can either go left or we can go down. So there's two, we, two ways that we could handle this. One would be to say, okay, if we can go left or we can go down, then maybe we could go diagonal. But that's not always true in all cases. Um, one case would be something like this, where maybe uh, left and down would be the same. Actually, let me actually create this if I can. Yeah, so for, for example here, at this 10, we could either go left or we could go down, but we can't go diagonal left down. Right? So let's use this 10 as an example, and now I'll switch to my vector field view, and it says if I go left or if I go down, I will get to the goal um, in the same amount of time. Okay, so that's the direction that I would want to go in my pathfinder. And so as we saw before, if you have a game like uh, Path of Exile or Diablo or any other like top-down um, ARPG type game, then what, what you might have in that game setting is, for example, oh, I've got like a million zombies all over the map, and those million zombies all want to head towards the player. And so the player might be representative of this yellow uh, cell here in our navigation mesh. So what we're doing on top of all this, in order to get the full marks in the assignment, uh, you're going to implement some drawing of things moving toward this goal location. Okay, so let me turn off the display here real quick, and I'll press the P key, and the P key for the uh, for the solution turns on the particle system that I that I wrote. So here, um, the way that my particle system works, and you do not have to implement this uh, exactly as I did, is that I'm going to spawn a bunch of random particles, and so the particles here are these uh, different shade of pink quads that are being drawn to the screen, all right? And those particles spawn at a random location. If they happen to spawn inside one of the rectangles, then they just respawn. And they head toward the goal. And when they reach the goal, they just spawn at a new random location in the environment, okay? And then while they exist, they head toward the goal and they do that by following the vector field. So at any point here, what happens in my particle system is that for each particle, I look up its location in the vector field, and then I say, what direction should I actually move? And so I look up that direction, and then I set that direction as the speed of the particle, and then that particle heads towards the goal. Okay?
And for a final little bit, um, oh, I, I also make sure that my particles don't collide with any of the, the cells that they can't walk on, right? So um, you have to put in a little bit of collision checking there. And I also put in a little bit of steering to sort of give it this smooth movement. So you can see that even though our vector field is uh, only up, down, left, and right movement, I do end up with some nice smooth movement um, even like curved movement in my actual implementation because that's the smooth steering that I've been talking about. So let's recreate one of these sort of bad examples that we talked about with our, um, with our vector field being kind of abstract and inaccurate. So here, for example, if I resize this rectangle and I resize this rectangle, then I can, my particles can no longer go through this area, right? So they can't go through that area because the grid in the nav mesh says that it's blocked, so they go up and around. But that's obviously pretty inaccurate, so if I just increase the number of cells in my navigation mesh, okay, and I, I, I have this slight bug in my particle system where the, uh, the, the, the goal doesn't update properly, so forgive me for that. But if I increase the number of cells, then this problem goes away, right? And now so they can properly navigate through this area. So you can see that we can move around the obstacles in real time. We can resize them in real time. We can drag the goal around in real time. And all of the pathfinding and all of the particles will update in real time. Okay, so that's basically it. Oh yeah, if I um, increase the number of particles in my system, you know, I can do a lot of particles. You don't necessarily have to get your system to be as fast as this, but just to show you sort of what is possible, you know, we're doing 130,000 particles here at 100 frames per second, essentially. So you can get this to work pretty fast. So that's what I wanted to show you. Um, however, when you get the assignment, it will look like this, okay? So none of that will be implemented. There's like a random red square here. What the hell is that? Well, I'm gonna show you what all that means. There's no particle system yet. You can see that there's no like, no solution stuff. So this is what you get when you get the assignment. And then you have to implement sort of the back end part of this to do all of the, the distance map, the vector field, and the, the particle system. Okay, so the assignment is a little bit involved. But don't worry, I, I don't think it's conceptually that difficult. Like, it's not something that's overly complex. There's just a bit to it, right? Okay, so, oh, the last thing that I want to show you is um, inside the assignment, if I hit the H button, there's one other thing, which is run assignment timing test, okay? So running the assignment timing test uh, I want to show how this works, so I need to unmaximize this. Okay, so whenever you run your assignment, you're going to get a terminal over here, and you're going to get the assignment itself, right? So what is that timing test? Well, if I come back here, essentially what will happen is the timing test will loop through every single open location in the environment. It will set that as the goal, and it will calculate the vector field to that location, okay? So for example, what it would do in this situation is it would set the goal to here, calculate the vector field. Set the goal to here, calculate the vector field. Set the goal to here, calculate the vector field. And it'll do that all the way down to here until it has calculated possibly thousands of vector fields, okay? So if I click the T button, you can see here it says, oh, this is quite small. Let me see if I can, um, properties, edit. Yeah, I'm gonna increase that font size. Okay, so it says running grids, uh, running tests for grid size equal to 32. So what grid size equal to 32 means is that currently in my grid, my grid cells are 32 pixels by 32 pixels size. Okay, so this is 32 pixels by 32 pixels. Um, so it says time test results, total cells 627. So that means that there were 627 blank cells. The total time for all the calculations 
was, and as this is measured in microseconds, so this is 0 0.008 uh, seconds, and the time per cell is 13.96 microseconds, okay? So this was a quite a fast test. My solution code is, is quite fast, but what I can do here is I can increase the number of cells and run the timing test again. So whenever I hit that W key, it essentially doubles the number of cells, right? So it, it, well, it multiplies it by four actually because it halves in each direction. So now I have 2,500 cells and it sets each of those to the goal location and it does all the calculations. Let's increase it again and I'm gonna run it for here. So in my solution for a grid size equal to eight, it takes about half a second to run the timing tests. Um, the 64-bit version of the program is about 0.45 seconds, but this is what I, we're going to do this for your assignment, okay? So we're gonna launch the assignment, we're gonna hit the W key twice to set the size equal to eight, and then we're gonna hit T, and then that will be your time. Please don't be concerned if you're not under a second, okay? It took me a long ass time to get my time under a second for this assignment. If you are, that's absolutely amazing. Um, but use the use the solution time as a sort of, you know, dream goal to get to, that you want your assignment to run that fast, but please don't be concerned if it's not that fast, all right? But we are going to be choosing, you know, the top few um, assignments in terms of running time uh, to give a little bonus to, okay? So there's that, there's that, always that incentive to do, you know, more than just the base assignment um, stuff in the class. So there we go. Um, we're going to run the timing test like that. And if we increase it again, let's see how long this takes to run. I think it's around seven seconds or something like that. And this is with OBS running in the background and all that. Okay, so eight seconds for grid size equal to four. So we did... 42,319 cells. So there were 42,000 calculations of the distance map in just under eight seconds. So that's that's pretty fast, okay? So we've got um, like 0.2 milliseconds per distance map calculation. So that'll give you an idea of even if we're using this fine-grained um, of a, uh, a grid for our navigation mesh, we can still calculate this stuff pretty quickly. Alrighty, so I've got Visual Studio open here. Let me get into the readme file for the assignment. So I'll get into the readme file. I'll go through all of this so we'll get all the details and then I'll go through the code to show you how you actually implement stuff. So um, for this assignment, you're gonna be able to change multiple files. So the way you're going to submit this is you're just going to zip your source folder and submit that zip file. Okay, that's how you're gonna submit this. Uh, and make sure that you include, you know, all your names and stuff in the assignment. All right, so I don't need to talk about that. That's old news. Here is the uh, important stuff, though, the program specification. In this environment, in this assignment, you'll be computing three different grids based on an environment will, which will be specified in a configuration file, okay? So that essentially means that this environment, these rectangles, are specified in this um, environment.txt file, which is in with the assignment, okay? So all this does is it specifies the width and the height of the window, and then the top left and the bottom right of each rectangle. Really simple, it just reads in from there and creates the, um, the environment. So that configuration file is pretty simple, it just loads the environment from there. The three grids that you must compute are located in the vector field class as member variables, and are, be, are to be computed whenever the vector field compute function is called, okay? So they are as follows and must be computed in this order. So the very first thing that you have to compute is the blocked or unblocked grid, okay? So in my solution, that is the redness. So the grid in the background, you have to calculate this grid, this, this which, whether or not it should be black or red, which is essentially a zero or a one, whether or not it is unblocked or blocked. So this is essentially our navigation mesh. This grid is used to denote whether a cell is considered blocked or unblocked by the rectangles in the environment. A blocked cell is denoted by a one 
and an unblocked cell is denoted by a zero. If any rectangle in the environment intersects with any part of a cell, it is considered blocked. So what does that mean? Well, if we go back in to our example, and let me uh, full screen this again. It means that if any part of this rectangle, you can see as soon as it starts to intersect with a cell, then that cell is considered blocked. Okay, so you have to go through and do those calculations, and we covered that in class. We covered a nice little optimization for that. You can access the rectangles in the environment by calling the function environment get rectangles, which returns a vector of rect class objects which are defined in rect.hpp. This grid must be computed first in order to compute the next grid. Okay, so let's go have a look at the code and we'll cover the things that we just talked about in this first grid. So first of all, uh, we've got a number of files in this assignment. Apologies that this uh, font is a little bit small. So we've got our environment class, we've got our rectangle class, and we've got our grid class. So first, let's look at the grid class. So as we explained in the lectures, a grid can be implemented as essentially just a two-dimensional array, okay? So in this assignment, we're using an, a vector of vectors to represent our grid. So here in the grid class, this is templated on some class type, which means that we can specify a grid of integers or a grid of doubles or a grid of booleans or whatever type of grid that we want. So our grid class just stores the width and the height of the grid. And this is the number of cells in the grid in the width and the number of cells in the height, okay? So for our assignment here, for example, the default grid, it says it has size 32, meaning the grid cells are of size 32, um, but there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So there's 23 or 24, that would be the height, the number of cells in the y direction and the number of cells in the x direction. So all this class does is it's sort of a wrapper around a, a vector of vectors, okay? So you can set up a grid with a uh, constructor of a width and a height and a value. And what this will do is it will call um, the STL vector class and it will initialize a 2D array uh, or sorry, it will initialize a vector of vectors and all of those vectors will be filled with that value, okay? So for example, if I said um, grid, uh, actually, I'll show you an example when we get to that because that's I, I have that already explained there for you. And then the grid class has some um, accessibility options so you can get um, the, you can pass in an X and a Y to get the value at that grid location. You can call the set function to set different values and you can call the width and the height. So in the assignment, you can actually change this grid class if you want to. If you find a faster way to implement a grid than a vector of vectors, be my guest. You can completely change the grid class if you think that will speed up your program. But please understand that you can't change any of the public facing functions of that. You still have to have these get functions, set functions, width and height. That still has to work properly because that's how the, the user interface interacts with the assignment. And again, please do not do any optimizations at all until you've gotten the assignment to work first because the vast majority of the marks are just forgetting it to work, okay? So that's the grid. Now we know how we're actually going to be storing our data for this assignment, okay? Next, let's look at the rect class. So the rect class is just our rectangles, okay? So the environment has rectangles in them. So for example, this is a rectangle. It has a top left corner and it has a bottom right corner. All right, so that, that's pretty easy. So here, um, oh, we are, we are also going to be specifying our rectangles instead of top left and bottom right, we are specifying them by top left and width and then top left and height. So this bottom right corner here is top left dot X plus width in the X direction and top left dot Y plus height in, in the Y direction. So pretty easy calculation. But the rectangle class, this rect class is just a very, very simple class that stores 
uh, an X and a Y, that's the top left corner of the rectangle, and then a width and a height. It has a constructor, which takes in all of those values, and then it has some functions here. So for example, we have an equals operator, and that is can be used to say, is this rectangle equal to another rectangle, for example. So in, here, for example, we just check to see if the X and Y values of this rectangle are the same as the other rectangle, and are the width and the height of this rectangle the same as the other one. Very, very simple stuff. I just wanted to give you some uh, sample functions here so you can modify this rectangle class if you want to. You can modify anything in this class in, in any of these files for this assignment to make it as fast as possible. Here's a little helper function which may be um, pretty useful for this assignment. So this is a function on the rect class called contains and you get passed in an X and a Y, which is the X and Y locations of a point in the environment. So what this does is we say we're going to return um, whether or not this point is within this rectangle. So for example, uh, take my mouse cursor as the point. Uh, right here, my mouse cursor is considered within this rectangle, right? So it would be true if we called that rectangle dot contains whatever, wherever my mouse lo location is. And so the calculation for the mouse cursor, or uh, sorry, the calculation for whether or not a rectangle contains a point is pretty easy, right? You could figure this out. It's just, is the point between the left-hand side and the right-hand side and the top and the bottom? And that's what this calculation here is doing. Is it just, is the X between the left and the right, and is the Y between the top and the bottom. So you can use that contains function if you want for whatever calculations. And just another sample thing here, just, just some sample code to show you how you can put new functions on a class. Um, this does nothing. Whether or not you would want an intersect function, that's up to you. I just put it in there um, as a sample function. So that's what a rectangle is. And now that we know what a rectangle is, we can go over and look at what the environment is. So again, the environment essentially is just all of the rectangles, okay? Where do the rectangles live? That's it. So the environment class is gonna be pretty simple. Um, the environment has a width and a height. That width and height is the window size, okay? So for example, I think by default, it's like 1280 by 720. And so this would be 1280, this would be 720. So that's the width and the height. And then we just have a vector of rectangles. Okay, so this is the rect class. We have a vector of rectangles. Um, the environment has this file called env.txt, which specifies um, what the, the properties of the rectangles. And I've written that already for you. So uh, an environment is going to be given a file uh, as input, and then it just sets up all the different rectangles. So you don't need to do anything with that. That's just there for you. And then the environment has a few helper functions, which is just to get the width and the height of the environment. And you can also get access to the rectangles themselves. So for example, in the assignment, you're gonna to want to be able to loop through these rectangles in order to calculate which cells are actually being blocked by the rectangles, right? And I've got some sample code there for you. Uh, and I'll go over that now in a, in a couple of minutes. Okay, so where you're going to be spending the majority of your time in this assignment is in the vector field class, okay? So the vector field class is where all of these grids are located that you have to calculate. So those grids are there for you and you just need to set their values. Uh, so let's go over the entire vector field class now. Um, so I've got a couple of little helper structs here. If you want to uh, use them, you can. So one is a direction. So this direction is going to be used um, in order to calculate which direction you should go, okay? So what's the best way to explain this? Okay, so the direction is going to be the direction you should head in inside your vector field. So for example, over here, when I look at my vector field, right, I've got some directions here. So uh, let's open up the chalkboard one second i'm just uh resizing this okay so oops my uh, thing is still full screened all right 
So a direction is essentially which direction do we want to go? So it's just going to be an X and a Y. So if we have grid cells here like this, okay? So let's say that we have a six in this cell. That's pretty, uh, pretty skinny. If we had a six in this cell, and we have a seven here, uh, a seven here, maybe a five here, and a five here, okay? So if we're calculating which direction we should go, if this is our distance map, then we're going to want to go up or we're going to want to go left from here, right? So our direction would look like this. It's up, it's left. So the X and Y of the direction are really simple. The y direction here is going up so the direction x would be zero because we're going up and the y goes when it's going upwards it's negative so this will be negative one and going left is going to be negative one in the x and zero in the y okay so this is what a direction is it's just the x and the y of the vector field that's it for each cell in the vector field um here I have a cell. I don't think I actually use the cell class. Just let me comment this out. I don't know why I left that in there. Let me see if it runs without that. Yeah, it does. Okay, so ignore this cell thing, but you're free to calculate to use like any sort of um, data structure that you want. The only rule for the assignment is you can't change the function signatures of any of the public facing things because that's what the user interface uses. Okay. So the vector field has the following um, private member variables. And these are you're going to need to know what these are for your computations. First, it has a spacing. So this is the spacing of the grid in pixels. So this is uh, set to 16 here. Let me go over to my vector field real quick. Do, 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 do. So by default, that's set to 16. It has a width and a height. That is the number of rows and columns in the grid, okay? Then there is a MGX and GY. That is the goal X cell and the goal Y cell. And then we have the three grids that we're going to have to compute. So the first one is the blocked or unblocked grid. So this is a grid of integers, zero meaning unblocked, one meaning blocked. Then we have the distance grid. This is just the distance to the goal location. And then we have a grid of vectors of directions, okay? And that is the vector field direction grid. So if we come back over here to our, uh, to our blackboard, essentially the way that this is being stored by default, if we have up and left, then the vector that we will have in this cell, if I represent a vector like this, it will be, uh, let's say, up first and then left next. Okay, so we're representing the directions that we can go at this cell by a vector of directions. So every cell initially has a blank vector of directions, right? And then as you calculate the directions for the vector field, you're adding those directions to the vector of directions that you should travel at that cell in the vector field, okay? So that's, I mean, pretty straightforward. The syntax, if you're not used to it, might be a little bit confusing, but that's pretty cool that our grid class, since it's templated, it can store anything, right? So it can store integers or it can store vectors of directions. Cool. Um, so those are the only variables that are there by default. You can add variables if you want, if you think they'll, they'll make your solution better. Um, just don't remove anything that's currently there. Okay. Um, the first public facing function that we have is this compute function. Okay. So the compute function is called by the user interface. So whenever we um, make changes, so for example, whenever I uh, move a rectangle, or I increase or decrease the size of the grid, the compute function is called. And it's also called at the start of the program. So the compute function is going to pass in to this vector field an environment containing the rectangles. It's going to pass in the spacing, which is the grid cell spacing in pixels. 
and then it's going to pass in a goal X and a goal Y. So essentially, based on the environment, the spacing, and the goal X value and the goal Y value, you have to compute all of these grids. Okay? So let's just look at some sample code that I have uh, already in the vector field class. So here's the compute function that you're going to be spending most of your time in. Okay? So the compute function, uh, again, it takes in an environment, it takes in a spacing, it takes in a goal X and Y. So I've got some helper code for you here to start out with, and you basically have to implement this function for the assignment. So I'm going to set up the spacing to be, so my member variable spacing, I'm just going to store that so I can refer to it later. And that's going to be equal to the spacing that we uh, put in. So the user interface calculates the spacing based on your input and then passes it into this function. Then, in order to calculate the width and the height of the grid, you're going to take the width of the environment that's measured in pixels, and you're going to divide it by the spacing. Okay, so for example, if I launch this again, if I have a uh, solution that's like 1280 pixels wide, and if I have a spacing of 32 pixels, then the number of cells wide is going to be equal to uh, 1280 divided by 32. Okay. Um, I see a couple of questions out, out there in the chat. I'll get to those once I'm finished this section. And then I'm going to store the goal X and the goal Y as well so that I can make calculations on that. So in this function, the first thing that we have to do is compute the grid of blocked or unblocked cells and store those results in the m underscore grid function. If an environment rectangle overlaps a cell, it is blocked. Okay, so that was the first thing that we said we had to do in the readme. Now let's go to the second thing that we have to do in the readme, is calculate the distance grid. So that, that uh, is the m underscore distance variable. This grid is used to compute and store the distances from all cells to a given goal cell. That is the GX and GY in the compute function. The distance map is used to compute the four directional cardinal movement with each action given a cost or distance of one. Okay, so we're moving up, down, left, and right. Each action cost is one. It is not mandatory that you compute the distance map with a BFS, but it's probably the fastest way to do so. The distance map should be given initial values of negative one, which denote that no path exists from the goal to the given cell. This grid must be computed in order to compute the next grid. So let me just show you, for example, here uh, in my solution, let's create an area. And someone just had this question in the chat about an area which is um, not, which is, what's going on here? Oh, I've got two of them open. Uh, which is an area that is unconnected, okay? So here, let's create an area down here in the bottom right. Let's move this one up here, and let's move this one down here. So if I set my goal right here, I cannot reach this area down here, okay? So if I compute my distance map, this area still has all of those negative ones, right? And it has negative ones because the whole distance map is going to be given a value of negative one at the start, and then we compute the distance map. And the distance map is a BFS outward from the goal, and since it's a BFS outward from the goal and we can't reach it, then it will still have that value of negative one, okay? So essentially, this is still a good calculation because in our video game, if there's a couple of zombies trapped over here, well, we, we know that they can't reach the player. So they may as well not pathfind anywhere, okay? So that's what that uh, calculation means. And here in the code, second, after you've computed the grid of blocked or unblocked cells, then you would compute the distance map, okay? And just make sure when you're computing the distance map that you are not calculating values that are blocked. Right, so all the values that are blocked still have a value of negative one because we can't walk on those tiles. So back to the readme. Um, the third thing that you have to do is calculate the vector field slash direction grid. And this is M underscore directions. Each cell of the grid stores a vector of direction objects, each of which consists of an X and a Y component. 
The directions stored in each cell must point to the adjacent cell with the lowest value from the distance map. If there is a tie, then all directions pointing to all lowest values must be stored in the cell. So all that means again is this here where you would have, okay, let's just go over that once more. If I have like a six here and I have a five here and a five here and a seven here and a seven here, then the direction I want to travel in from this cell, the six cell is right or down. So I would calculate the direction, the X and Y for right, which is one zero and down, which is zero one. And then the vector for this, so the M directions vector would look like this. You would have one zero, that would be right, and you would have zero one, and that would be down. Okay, so that's what you're doing in this one. So that literally just consists of a for loop going over your whole distance map. And for each one, go to look at each four directions, calculate which one is the minimum or a tie break for the minimum, and then put those into the uh, directions vector. Okay, and then this is where you would do that here. You would just compute that, you know, you put it into this function. Now, you are free to add any amount of functions that you want to this class, okay? So for example, if you want to add a function, which is calculate navigation mesh, then you're free to do that. You have the header, you have the CPP file. If you then want to create a function, which is compute distance map, you can do that. If you want a function, which is compute vector field. So what your thing may look like, um, is something like compute nav mesh. There's a function call compute distance map. There's a function call compute um, vector field. There's a function call. Okay, so you would add these to the header file, then you would like put your code in there. And this makes it a little bit neater than having like maybe a hundred lines of code in this one function here. If you want to have a BFS function that's like recursive or iterative or whatever, you can create that. That's fine. Um, so in order to do all this stuff, you're going to have to, um, oh, and it says you can create new methods in vector field in dot H and vector field dot CPP. So here is some sample code to get you start started on how to do this. So here is how, this is the syntax for setting up a new grid. Okay. So if we look over here, we have the, uh, M grid variable that is the blocked or unblocked grid. It's a grid of integers. So if we want to set up a grid of a particular size with a particular data type, here is the very easy syntax for doing that. So set the grid to be a new grid of all zeros. Okay. So if we set it, um, we pass in a width, we pass in a height and we pass in an initial value. Okay. So if I go over here, um, to your student code and I hit A, then all of these are negative one because this is the, well, they're all zero because the GUI will draw anything with a one as a red cell, okay? Uh, so that's what I've done here. Now, how do you actually set values inside that grid? Well, I could call this, let me move this up here. I don't know why that's down so low. Let's set a particular cell to be blocked, okay? So in order to set something as blocked, I would just say mgrid.set75, that's the x, y location in the grid, and here's the value. So let me set another one. Um, let me set uh, 85. So this is the cell to the right of that one. Now let's uh, compile this again and run it. And now I can see that there are two cells considered blocked by the user interface. So anything with a zero is drawn as a black tile. Anything with a one is drawn as a red tile. Okay. Nothing else has been calculated yet. So that's how you are going to do the, um, the nav mesh calculation. You're going to have something that goes through and you're going to calculate where the rectangles are intersecting the tile cells. And for each tile cell that's intersecting a rectangle, you're going to say grid dot set the X and Y location to one. That's it. Next, you're going to set up the distance map. Okay. So by default, the distance map is going to have uh, values of negative one. But let's just say I set that equal to negative five, for example. So this grid is initialized with the same width and the same height, but it gets negative five in this example. Okay, so if I hit A, then all of these values are negative five. 
See? So this, if I hit A, it's going to draw the distance map. If I hit A again, it's going to draw the, um, the vector field. But you can see here that the vast majority of these things are like little dots, and that's because I haven't added many vectors yet. So let's change that back to a negative one. And last, and probably most complicated, is the directions grid. So the directions grid is a grid of vectors of directions. And what we do initially is set that up to be a grid with the same width and the same height, but it is going to be a blank vector. So this just says each vector is initially empty, right? Eventually we'll put stuff in there, but we won't right now. So, um, here is how you would add something, add vectors to the vector grid, okay? So we have our grid of vectors of directions and I can get a reference to a particular cell if I want to, okay? So here I'm getting the direction vector, which is direction vector for a particular cell at seven, four. So this is one above this, um, this red one that I set before. And if I want to add a vector to it or a direction to that vector, I can just say push back one zero. I can say push back zero one. So what this does is it essentially just says, um, push in the right vector and push in the down vector at this location. So if I run this here and if I turn on the vector field, then you can see in here, let me make this a bit bigger, that I have a right vector and a down vector being displayed at location 74. Okay, so once you're, you go through, you're looking through all of your distance maps and you're just adding the directions toward the lowest values um, with this syntax. You're just saying, okay, and you don't need to have this, um, this temporary variable. You could just do this as well and this will work as well, okay? So get get my, my grid of direction vectors, get a particular vector from the grid, and then add a direction to that vector. That's the syntax for that. Um, last but not least in here, here's some sample code where you would actually um, look at the rectangles, okay? So your calculation of the distance map, if I had this up here, would look something like this. So here you would say, all right, um, let's just print out the, the properties of every rectangle, okay? So standard C out to, to print something, rect.x and then a comma and then rect.y and then a new line. All right, so every time I call the compute function, it's going to print out the x and y values of all the rectangles. So here we just saw when I called compute, it printed out, oh, you can't see that. It printed out over here. It's a bit small, but you can see that it's computing that. And whenever I move any of the rectangles or I resize the grid, it's also printing that out because the compute function is called every time. Okay, so that's basically it for what you have to do for the calculation of those parts of the assignments. Let's go back to the readme file and see if we're missing anything. Oh yes, so moving entities. This is the fun part. So, well, one of the fun parts in my opinion. 10% of the assignment grade is reserved for the adding of some sort of moving entities into the GUI, which follow the directions of the computed vector field. Getting this to work with 100 particles or more will ensure you get the full 10% of the grade. Okay, so all that means is if I look over here at the solution, um, I have a button here which turns on the particle display. And those particles follow the vector field. Now, you don't necessarily have to have this working for tens of thousands of particles. I know that that's a bit of a stretch in terms of optimization. But as long as you can get 100 particles working, so that looks a bit like this, then you'll get full marks on that part of the assignment. Okay, so the way you're going to do that, um, I'm not going to show you exactly how to do that, but it will involve mo modifying the user interface. So I'm going to um, show you the user interface code once we, once we finish with the readme file, okay? So we'll just save that part for last. And that's, that's it for the functionality. So here's a couple of notes. First, 
you must calculate each grid each time compute is called. So here, for example, if I go back to the solution again, uh, let's say that we have this scenario where I have a rather large grid. Now, technically, if you were writing a video game and you wanted the maximum possible performance out of this, if you moved a rectangle and it did not affect the underlying navigation mesh. So you can see here that I'm moving the rectangle, but it is not overlapping any different cells. The grid itself, the nav mesh is staying the same even though I'm moving this thing. So what you would do for like super hardcore optimization is you would see first whether or not you actually need to update the grid, right? Because if you're moving an, an obstacle, but the nav mesh isn't changing, there's no need to update your pathfinding. But in this assignment, don't do that, okay? So I realize that if the environment rectangles do not change, then the blocked grid does not need to be recomputed. But please recompute all three grids each time. This way it will be possible to fairly time all of the solutions for all students. So don't go that far with the optimization. You have to recompute each grid each time. So just please do that. And you must calculate and store the results of all the grids. You are not allowed to be sneaky and calculate individual cell results when the get direction or get distance functions are called, okay? You must compute the values of all grid cells once in the grid function. The get grid, get distance, and get direction functions must only return pre-calculated stored values somewhere in the vector field class. So what does this mean? It means down here, when I call get direction, okay, that is when the user interface actually goes to draw those vectors, right? So technically, if you're trying to be really sneaky, you don't necessarily need to pre-calculate everything. You could just calculate this one vector when I call this, but don't. What I'm saying is you have to do all of your calculations in the compute function and then these functions down here are just returning values that you've already calculated. Okay, so I hope I hope that's a little bit more clear. Okie doke. So let's quickly look at the user interface so that you can implement um, the moving entities part of the assignment. All right. So let's go over to the user interface class. Let's look at the header first. So I've got a bunch of stuff in this user interface. There's a lot of variables and most of this has to do with the resizing of the rectangles, okay? Because like, that's not some library that I imported. This resizing of the rectangles is all done from scratch by hand from me, okay? So I implemented that. It detects where the mouse is, which rectangle there is, whether or not it's like close to the edges of the rectangle and allows you to draw, that's all like from scratch coding that you don't need to worry about. But a lot of this code in the user interface is that, okay? But what you do need to worry about is essentially the render function, okay? So let's look through here. There's a lot of code, but in the render function down here, okay? Do, 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 do. Okay, this is where everything is being drawn down here in the render function. So, for example, um, I have a rectangle color, a mouse over color. I have a rectangle that I'm using to draw all the shapes. I have a tile color, which is either black or red, depending on whether or not it's blocked. So, for example, here is the code in which you, which you would use to draw the tiles. So, the drawing of the tiles is pretty easy. You just go over for each X and each Y in the grid. So the field here, the variable field, is the vector field. That is where you would get that data. So vector field, field, environment, env. Those are the two variables that you would use to get all this data. Go back to the UI. Um, it just basically says, if I am blocked, right? So my color is initially going to be black. If I'm not blocked, just leave it black and draw the grid. Otherwise, if I am blocked, draw this red rectangle, okay? And so all the, co all the code there for the drawing of rectangles 
is, is already there for you. Um, next is really simple. I'm just drawing the navigation mesh. I'm drawing the grid. Um, I'm drawing the tiles and I'm drawing the lines and I'm drawing the rectangles. Okay, so that's all the rest of the user interface. It's pretty straightforward. If you look at any of the SFML stuff, it's there for you. So what you would have to do is whenever you render the scene, just draw some entities that are following the grid lines toward, um, sorry, following the vector field directions toward the goal. That's all you have to do. Now, what I will show you is that if you go to my course, my, my website, and you go to teaching, and you look at my last course, okay, 4300, there over here, if I make this a little bit bigger, I did an entire lecture on how to implement a very efficient particle system. So you can completely just draw your own rectangles. That's completely fine. But if you are interested in creating your own particle system, I have an entire lecture on that, okay? Where we go through and we create the exact particle system that I use in my, um, in my solution, okay? So you can see here that like by the end, we have particles that we're drawing that look very similar to the particles um, that, that I'm currently using. And if you go to, where is this? Uh, do, do, do. Uh, I'll put the URL here somewhere because I don't have that. Let me edit this right now, actually. So if I go to the PDF link, sign in, and instead of lectures, do, 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 I go to code. All right, so this is code for the course. So let me make that link right now. Course sample code, and I will put in this link. There we go. So if you're watching this, not live, that link now exists. So you're going to click that. And all of the code for that particle system is right here. So I have a main.cpp. I have a particle system.hpp. HPP just means it's a header and CPP file in one. So all of the code for that particle system is there. And if you want to, if you feel like integrating that into this assignment, you can just take my particle system code. Okay, and if you watch that video, you'll see how, how easy it is to modify and how easy it is to actually set up for that purpose, okay? So please feel free to take this code from our course code. That's why I've put it there. All right, so that is the assignment. Um, what is this? Oh, I've got more stuff to read. Okay, <laughs> my apologies. More hint stuff. Okie doke. So the, the user interface description and controls. So the user interface has been implemented for you. It draws all of the rectangles of the environment as well as the grid cells and values. Unblocked cells are shown as empty while blocked grid cells are shown in red. A timer is drawn in the bottom left of the screen which displays how long the previous call to vector field compute took measured in microseconds. Um, you can set a new goal position with the left mouse button the mouse can be dragged while it's held to continuously recompute. You can click and drag the center of a rectangle to reposition it. You can drag the centers or the sides of a rectangle to resize it. Uh, here are all the um, keyboard controls. Uh, they're listed in the program and I've already talked about those. Here is the description of the configuration file. You don't need to worry about that too much and some extra incentive and bonus marks. The top three fastest running code will be uh, run live in the class. I will also talk to the groups about what they did to optimize their code. You will receive a D2L trophy and you can get up to 5% bonus marks on the assignment by implementing steering behaviors for the entities that move around the grid. And just a couple of hints to end it off with, you are allowed to change the grid.hpp class to try and make it faster. Just be sure not to change any existing function declaration syntax so that the class will still work with the GUI. Okay, so you can change that if you want, just make sure that you don't change the public facing code. And you can change the way that any of the grid data is stored in the vector field class 
from the way that it is given in the example. However, I recommend first getting it to work properly with the example code, since it's by far the easiest way of getting the assignment to work. So this is a little bit, I guess this is a little bit confusing, but inside the vector field class, by default, what I have are these three data structures. And I have said, compute these three data structures. Now, by all means, start the assignment by using those three data structures to compute and store your values, okay? However, the fastest possible solution for this assignment would not use data structures that look like this. These are not the most efficient way to store things for this assignment, okay? Now, you're not gonna get a ton of bonus marks by being the fastest or anything like that, but if you are interested in super optimizing things, you don't necessarily need to use these data structures. However, what you do need to do is make sure that all of these public facing functions are correct, okay? So let's say for example, instead of a grid of integers, you had a grid of bools. Well, you would still need to return a zero or a one from the get grid function. Or for example, something you could do to store the directions is store a bit set instead of a vector of directions. Okay, so remember we talked about this last time in, in class, there was an optimization about like bit sets for directions. So in here, if you had a grid of bit set objects instead of a vector of directions, be very careful because now down here in the get number of directions function and in the function where I actually get the direction, you have to, you still have to return this direct direction object. So if this was, you know, if you actually stored bit sets, then down here you would have to convert your bit set into a direction object. Okay, so that's more on the super optimization side of things in order to get your code to run as fast as possible. But it's just telling you that, yes, these are here for you as the easiest possible way to get full marks, right? You implement it like this, you write your for loops, you do your distance map, you do your directions, done, full marks in the assignment. However, if you wanna be the fastest, you can change how these are stored. And for my solution, I definitely did. Mine look nothing like this, okay? However, just realize that now your other functions have to return still the same values. So they have to return the number of directions, the direction, the distance, um, the zero or the one in order for the user interface to work correctly. And it'll be pretty obvious whether or not it's working correctly if your UI crashes or not, right? So apologies if that confused a few people, but I'm just saying that even though these are there, that's not necessarily how the final solution, if you want to work really, really fast will, or if you want to compute really, really fast will look. And that's okay. And then you just take your whole source folder, you zip it up and you send me that and that's what will run uh, to grade it. Okay, that is it for the assignment. Uh, it looks like a lot, a lot of work, but it's really not. It's just looping over some 2D vectors. I'm sure you'll be fine. Oh, really quickly to go over the uh, marks for the assignment. So we have uh, 5% for code modularity and readability and style stuff. Uh, so just basically keep using the same style that I'm using. So some edge case handling. Um, your program should not crash if a rectangle is partially off the screen and your program should not crash if the goal is within a rectangle. Your, um, your particles may bug out, but just don't crash. Um, your distance map calculation, that's worth 40. Your vector field calculation is worth 40. Um, so it has to compute and display correctly and show multiple directions. Um, the calculation speed, the program should run in real time for reasonable grid sizes. So you should be able to drag around the goal or a rectangle in real time for size eight. And the timing test for size eight should take less than one minute. So if I run my solution here and I go to size eight 
and I run the test. Size, uh, test for size eight. Mine runs in half a second. Okay. So I hit the T key. It runs in half a second. Yours has to run in under one minute. Okay. So it can be 120 times slower than the solution. That's what I'm letting you be. You may, that may, you know, may chuckle, but getting it under that minute the first time, you know, that's, that's a lot of work. So, uh, and also for size eight, you should be able to drag around your rectangle and not have it lag the program. Okay. Um, the entities following the vector field uh, added to the GUI, that's 10% of the assignment. And some dumb ways to lose mark, don't, you know, don't submit it late, only submit the zip of the source directory and no additional files added to the source directory. Okay, so those are the marks. Um, I think it's it's pretty clear what, what you need to do. And the assignment will be available for download at midnight tonight. So I'll put them up there. Uh, I actually had the assignments up last night for a few minutes and I realized there was a mistake in some of the code for, um, for what I had put up there. So if you randomly happened to be clicking that link last night and you happened to catch one of those, just get rid of that and, and download it again um, after midnight tonight because uh, that was incorrect and it won't have the exact same stuff that I showed in class today. Okay, and just keep in mind that assignment one um, is due today, uh, the same day that assignment two is being released. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me on, on Discord and I'll help you uh, set that all up. But since this is assignment two, everyone should already have their, um, their environments up and running by now because assignment one is due tonight. All right, that is it for today and I'll see you in the next class.